Christ Community Church, located at 25th and Thomas Avenue in Portsmouth, Ohio. Two or three things. Number one, I, I ask if, for those of you who pay attention to the Internet, I ask you to please, for my sake and yours, read some passages of Scripture before you get here. Now, the reason I told you that is because we're going to be dealing with subjects that most of you have little or no acquaintance with here in the book of Leviticus. You've heard some of the terms, so if you look in your bulletin, you'll see that I put, uh, Gary Harrison had a thing in there about volunteers, and then um, on the back of it, I put a little quiz, and that quiz has the terms that you need to familiarize uh, as yourself with in order to understand the scripture that we're dealing with. Because several of these terms you only find in the Bible. Some of them we have adopted and changed, but most of them and not. Thank you, Ralph. You're a good man. I don't care what your wife says about you. It's all right. 56? Okay. Yeah, that's, but you're, I got socks that old. <laughs> that's, uh, and so I want you to work on that little quiz, and then afterwards, if we have time, we may go over it. But it's going to take, I've got uh, more than I can possibly cover anyway. The other thing I want to mention, simply because it's so monumental, yesterday afternoon, Alice Kay and I went out to Rosemount at, and uh, attended a little party there for John and Sarah Gimperline. If you look in your bulletin, you'll see that uh, on the 8th, he and uh, Sarah have their anniversary. John's 92 and Sarah's 90, and they will have been married on the 8th, 70 years. That's kind of neat, isn't it? You know, and and not last night, uh, and I, I, as far as I know, here at church they get the gold, the gold trophy. Uh, Rennie and Sudie Green will have their anniversary this coming week as well. I think it's on the 9th, I believe. Yeah, and uh, they will have been married 65 years. And as far as I know, and I may or may not be right here, uh, I think, and they get the uh, they get the silver trophy, and I think maybe Alice Kay and I get the bronze because we just polished off 62 in August, and right behind us, just with a few weeks different in this, are the Ellswicks. They've been married 60, uh, 62 as well, and there may be somebody that I've missed that I don't know about, but. I think, you know, we liked, I'm glad they had a party and out for John and Sarah, and all six of their children were there. And so they were having, and some of them were sleeping in tents in the yard and whatever. I just thought it was really neat for them. And they were saying they probably wouldn't be here this morning because the kids were heading back home and so on and so forth. But uh, they seldom ever miss. Um, the message that we have here. If, if you hadn't read the 23rd, 23rd chapter of the book of Leviticus and the second chapter of the book of Acts, most of it would be unfamiliar to you. Two or three principles to keep in mind before we jump into it. Many years ago, uh, when I was in school, there was a book written by a Dr. Milligan, who, and his book was entitled, The Scheme of Redemption. That scheme of redemption showed from the time that Adam and Eve sinned and were kicked out of the garden, how God had a plan even then that would up ultimately lead to the coming of the Messiah and with the promise of what would happen, uh, what you and I, the benefits of what you and I would enjoy as a result of God executing this scheme or plan of redemption for mankind. And what you will see in these, because uh, here in the 23rd chapter of the book of Leviticus, there are five memorial feasts that were to be celebrated by the Jews. Now, they have more than that today because a Purim and some others have been added when es with what Esther did for the Jews and saving them later on. <clears throat> and so they have seven or eight now, Rosh Hashanah and so on. But... And because Jews, lo they love to party. We could learn something from them uh, when it comes to that, to celebrate things. And it's a good thing for the significant events in your life. We do that some with birthdays and anniversaries where we celebrate them uh, as we go along. Our culture is 
not too good at that anymore because uh, with uh, throwaway marriages and everything else, they some some they don't last too long. But uh, I, I encourage you as a family to celebrate those things because and 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 have a memorial feast about it occasionally, and invite the preacher and his wife and things like that that are really nice. Uh, in case you kind of missed out that and invite the preacher and his wife because <laughs> we we did all we got at John and Sarah's each one of us got a bottle of water so that was for what that's worth but I was reading in a commentary actually I have it with me uh, on on the book of Leviticus Matthew wanted me to be sure and read it and uh, and one of the one of the authors, David Platt, is a person that I have a lot of respect for. He has a big church. It used to be in Alabama, and now it's over in Washington, northern Virginia, in the Washington area. And that's where Cyrus and his family go. The uh, <clears throat> Bob McEwen goes there, who at one time was our uh, congressman from here. And in that book, in the opening part of it, there's an interesting story that I'd never read before about someone that the last name you all would recognize because it's about Eddie Rickenbacker and you have Rickenbacker Air Base up just south of Columbus named after him I'm certain anyway this and and the, the, the story goes that when he retired and went to Florida every evening every evening before sundown he meandered down to the beach out onto a pier with a bucket and in that bucket was a handful of shrimp and he didn't go to fish he went to feed the gulls now gulls are just I think awful they're filthy they're noisy so on but he would go and take the time every evening seven days a week right before sundown he would go out on the pier and he'd throw out uh, uh, some shrimp for the gulls to fight over and to fuss over and they look forward to his coming he'd, he'd been doing it for several years and he continued to do it until he died and when he was approached and asked why he did it, he told of how President Roosevelt had sent him and his crew of, in a B-17 to fly across the Pacific to take a very important message to General MacArthur during the war, Second World War. And some way along the line, somewhere in the Pacific, because of weather and some other things, they got lost and finally ran out of fuel and the plane went down. All seven of the men on the plane were able to get on a raft and they were on it for a good while. They'd been on it and they'd run out of food, they'd run out of water, and they had just gotten together and had a little prayer and Eddie Rickenbacker had laid down and pulled the, the cap over his face to try to get some sleep and some rest. And all of a sudden, something very strange happened. A seagull landed on his head while he was asleep. And he woke up, and he realized, if I can catch that bird, we'll survive. So he grabbed the bird, and the, uh, the, the bird had a shrimp in its mouth. They ate the shrimp, and they ate the bird. And they used the entrails or the guts of the bird to fish with, and that's the way they survived until they were finally picked up. And so out of appreciation for what he said God had done for him in rescuing him from what was certain death for him and his crew, for the rest of his life, he every day went to feed the gulls. If you look carefully here at these different feasts that we'll look at quickly and then try to get to Pentecost as quickly as possible, because I could spend, honestly, I could spend 45 minutes to an hour on each one of these feasts. They're so important. Because each one of them, and, and, and almost all the details in them, all point to the coming of the Messiah and what's going to happen when he comes. They didn't know who it was. They just were looking forward to that Redeemer who would come and restore Israel to its great that it had been known under David. So... The, in the order that they were given here in the, 20, in the 23rd chapter, you have, first of all, there's a few verses given over to, why, to the Sabbath, which means seventh day. And then they go to the Passover feast, 
which is the great act of God. Now, the Passover feast is also called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's the same feast because they were told, don't bother when you get ready to leave Egypt when God is rescuing you after the plagues he had sent on the Egyptians. You know, you, you've got to leave in a hurry. And you won't have time for yeast to do what it does. Yeast and leaven is all the same thing. And he said, so you, we, it is, we'll eat our supper, but it'll be of unleavened bread. And, uh, and they, they could take that with them because yeast bread will mildew and mold. Unleavened bread will last while they were on their trip from Egypt to the mountain of God called Mount Horeb there in the Sinai Peninsula. And if you remember, and probably the one thing that we have all seen, if you like movies, if you watch the Ten Commandments, if you haven't, you ought to because I think it's worth your while. Um, and some of the notes that come with it on the, uh, on the DVD. And I, I have one if you need to borrow it if you're that tight. But I want it back. What they were told to do, each one of them, they said, you know, we've t done all of these plagues and, and, uh, and Pharaoh has ceased to let the people go free. And so he finally said, look, here's the way it is. I'm going to pass over, pass through Egypt, and all of the firstborn are going to die unless you have shed the blood of a paschal lamb, and then the, the blood from the lamb should be put on the top and on each side of the door. And when I pass over or send my angel of death through there, if he sees the blood applied, the eldest will not die. But unless the blood is applied, and you know we have songs we sing about that. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so... And, and, then in the, and what God was doing here is he was preparing for you and me to understand how the, the application of the blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness and sets us free from the penalty of sin. Because you remember when Jesus came to John the Baptist to be baptized, he saw his cousin Jesus coming at a distance, and he looked at him and said, Behold the... Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. That word, it, he, he, he was saying, Jesus, just like the Paschal Lamb and the blood of the Paschal Lamb uh, gave life, that what Jesus has done in, in dying on the literal, the literal the, uh, altar of the New Testament is the cross. That's where Jesus died. That's where the sacrificial lamb was offered that takes away the sin of the world. Now, when you have this, you, you have to keep in mind now that the blood of Jesus that was shed there on the cross, the, the New Testament makes a great deal out of that. And so that we would never forget it. We would never forget it. It was at a Passover meal that Jesus sat with his disciples there in that upper room. And, 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 and he said, I desire to eat the Passover with you, 12, one more time. And while he was there, he said, so that you guys will never forget, we're going to institute a memorial. It was at the Passover meal that he took the cup of redemption, and he said, from now on, whenever you meet together, you will drink from this cup, and you'll take the, the, the unleavened bread that we called the matzah, and you will eat that, and the, and the unleavened bread is to remind you of my body that hung on the cross that was offered as a sacrifice, and the, and the wine the cup of redemption that we celebrate, that the Jews celebrate in the Passover meal, will, is to remind you of my blood. Now, the, the church through the years messed that up pretty bad. They got to the, Augustine is really, even though he was a brilliant church father, there were areas where he really messed up the cooking. And this is one of them because he said somewhere in the mass of the church that the, 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 the wine that it, there well, turns into some way or another, hocusy pocus turns into blood of Christ and, and because Jesus said, this is my blood. And uh, when he introduced it and, and the bread turns into his real body and, you know, it turns into something that's rather, I think, rather grotesque. Because when you look in the 11th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians, he simply says this. 
it's a memorial. When you eat, you do it in memory or remembrance of me. So it was there for that purpose. Now, I understand that this morning, you're, you're not going to get a traditional sermon. Probably this would be closer to a lecture. But I'm telling you, we really need to understand these terms so that when we read the Bible. And let me tell you something. I heard, I heard a preacher this morning, one that I, I know a little bit, not really well, but I know him, uh, was preaching. David Jeremiah was preaching. And he said something that all of us need to remember. He said, you know what? If you don't read your Bible on a daily basis, you're going to get in trouble. Because he said very few people, there's not much difference between your relationship between the living word than the written word. The written word is the transportation mechanism for us to get to know the living word who is Jesus much better. And if we don't love him enough to get to know something about him, uh, there's going to be really serious consequences. And I thought that was an excellent, I wish we could write that down and kind of put it all over everything so people can remember how important it is and what the value is of reading your Bible on a daily basis. Now, the Passover meal then was to be eaten and never forgotten, and Jesus replaced the Passover meal for the church with the communion service. And um, some churches take it quarterly, some take it whatever, and the Bible doesn't specifically say take it every time you meet, but it does imply that, and the early church did. They pro every meeting they had, I'm certain, because they anticipated the momentary return of Jesus. And so they were very serious about uh, taking the Lord's Supper. And they, even though they didn't have a preacher, many times they just had somebody who'd get up and read the Bible, read the Old Testament for them, and then take the Lord's Supper and share in fellowship in a fellowship meal. They did that routinely because they met in people's homes. They didn't have church buildings. They were actually, they used their money rather than to maintain a facility. They used it to help each other. I think they had it right, don't you? Now, when the children of Israel finally took the Passover meal and left and headed for the land of promise, Jewish tradition says from the time they left their homes until they got to Mount Sinai, the mountain, uh, the mountain of God there is called Mount Horeb. It's in the Sinai Mountains. And so they call it Mount Sinai in the Scriptures. But it took, so Jewish tradition says it took them 50 days to get there. All of those people took a while. It took them 50 days to get to the mountain of God where Moses went up into the mountains and was there for uh, 40 days. And while he was up there for 40 days, all kinds of problems uh, happened. If you remember, and you need to keep one thing in mind, because I've already told you, all of these meals, these feasts, are anticipating something in the future that if you understand what took place there, you can understand how it's going to relate to something in the future when the Messiah comes. Everything was looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. All of these feasts anticipated the coming of the Messiah because God knew what he was going to do and he knew when he was going to do it. And so he was preparing the people through these feasts to understand what he was doing when he actually did it. And we'll see that in Pentecost in just a few minutes. Now, so they got to the foot of Mount Sinai. Moses goes up into the mountain for 40 days to receive the law on the two uh, stone tablets that he was bringing down. And while he was gone, they did something really stupid. They, they actually said, well, Moses is gone. And see, he was up on this mountain. There was fire. There was smoke. There was a noise a racket up on the mountain, and it was called the mountain of God. And he was up there to receive the law. In fact, it's, the Jewish people call it the, the, the receiving of the law rather than anything else in their writings. And so they were up there, and when Moses comes down, they, they had already said, you know, we, Moses is gone, and we need a leader. And so they built a golden calf. Calf worship was common in Egypt. And that's where they had been for 430 years. And so they had adopted many of the pagan practices of the Egyptians, that being one of them. So they made this little goofy golden calf, and they were 
all kinds of licentious behavior that you know in worship of it because pagan worship says whatever you feel like doing it's okay to do so they followed their base uh, instincts and 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 you and i both do know that if we did what we feel like doing and one of the, and you need to know this one of the greatest problems that the church has had in the years that i have been alive is they have used feelings too many instances determine whether something is real or not. Instead of just accepting the Bible at face value, they have a tendency to say, well, how do you feel about it? Well, I don't think God gives a hoot and a holler how you feel about it. He does care whether you believe it and obey it. And we have a tendency sometimes to elevate our feelings as the basis of determining whether something is true or not. And feelings are as fickle as anything in the whole world. You can go to bed feeling fine and wake up the next morning with a headache feeling awful. And you've had eight hours of sleep. I mean, you cannot determine, allow your feelings to determine truth. This is truth. Jesus was the embodiment of God's truth. And this is the written word of God that helps us to understand the living word of God, who is Jesus himself. Now... When Moses came down, he said, look, we cannot let this thing go without addressing the problem. So here's the deal. Are you going to follow the true of the living God, or are you going to follow this thing that you've made with your hands? 3,000 said that they would follow those, the, the golden calf, and those people all died. They were slaughtered by the sword. Remember that. At the time the law was given, and the law was, the giving of the law was a monumental thing for the Jewish people. Before the law was given, they were just a hand, they were just a, a large gang of, of, of a mixed multitude, and they were a mess on the best day. What he did was he gave them, through the giving of the law to the Israelite people, he gave them what we would refer to in our culture as the Constitution and bylaws so that they could become a distinct people. And that distinct people God would develop because through them he was going to send the Messiah. And so they became a distinct group of people when God gave them, here's the, here's the way your country is to function. We have people today who want to do what they want to do. I'm, I, I'm just, I'll get political for a minute, and I'm not going to apologize for it. There is a strong movement in our nation today to support various tenets of socialism. Socialism is not only stupid because it's been a failure wherever it's been for some, a period of time, but it has always been an enemy of the church. It has always been. Socialism is an offshoot of Marxism. Those of you who, uh, and we've got teachers here who should have that in your head by now and know that there is a relation. It's just a type of, and, and they call conservatives Nazis. But that's, that's the, what, does the, what does the president call that, uh, the fake news or so on? The, the Nazis were socialist. That's what, the, that's what that name means. They were socialist. They weren't. And, and, and communism is a type of socialism. What was Russia called before it just fell apart because its whole system is a failure? What, what does national, what, what does it stand for? National Soviet Socialist Republic. They were socialist. And what happened to the church under socialism? It was an enemy. We can, because... The government, in under socialism, owns everything, and people work for the government. You don't own anything. As I told you, my brother lived in Germany, <coughs> died there, buried there, and he had what he thought was a little house with a garden and so on and so forth. And being an American, he thought he owned it. So one day he goes out, there's a bush there that's dying that he thought was ugly. He grubs it out with a grub and hoe and throws it away. And the mayor comes to town and says, hey, you didn't get a permit for that. He says, you mean tell me I can't grub out something in the yard? He said, no, 
If you move anything here, you have to get a permit, and then you have to tell us what you're going to put in its place, and you have to purchase that permit because under socialism, they own everything. You just work for the government. And you see, they got that concept out of the Bible, believe it or not. In, in because in God's system in Israel, God owned everything. The land was God's. And the people were his people. And that same principle is too in Christianity because you and I have been purchased. We've been redeemed from sin by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We've been redeemed and we were paid for by the shed blood of Jesus and we belong to God. And that's why we're called a holy people. Because holiness doesn't mean how pure you are necessarily. It means you have been set aside by God for his purpose. That's what holiness means. It has nothing to do with uh, women piling hair on their head and wearing dresses that cover their ankles and all that kind of stupid stuff. That's unrelated. The whole deal is, do you belong to Jesus Christ? Is he your king? And are you living to honor and to glorify him? If you are, you're his people. And that's what he sets you apart to do. I told you I wasn't going to preach, but I lied. Now, now, the question then came as a result of the, of the people turning from the true of the living God at the foot of Mount Sinai, and they went to the golden calf. Then, then the issue was, since all of these people were sinners, how can sinners come into the presence of the living God? For God is holy and pure. How can, and the Bible says, you know, God cannot t- tolerate that kind of behavior in his presence. So how is it possible for sinners like you and me to get into the, into the presence of the living God? So he sets up this series of feasts that deal with our sin and to make it possible to build a bridge so that we have access to the living God. And that blood, and, and, and just so that you all will remember, play that little video of, uh, of what took place in the Ten Commandments while I take another swig. Though we stand in the shadow of death, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. They're eating what's called the Seder meal. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Shield us through this night of terror, O King of the universe. Why is everyone afraid? Why is this night different from all others? Because this night the Lord our God will deliver us from the bondage of Egypt. If it is not forbidden to look upon the breath of pestilence, then see, for it is here. Do not look, Eliezer. Close the door, Joshua, and let death pass. This is just a little reminder that the shed blood there was the, as, when the when, as Moses said, when death passed over, he would see the blood and pass on over us and, and give life. But remember, at the foot of Mount Horeb, 3,000 died. Remember that number because it's going to come up again here in a second. 3,000 died as a result of sin and the giving of the law because the purpose, the New Testament says, the purpose of the law was to so it would point out what sin is. And, and in our culture today, we don't like the word sin because it indicates that you're responsible for your behavior. Some goofy guy wrote several years ago, because psychology and sociology have replaced the Bible as the primary influence in our culture. And it's a dangerous, it's a dangerous thing, but that's the way it's happening So that was the Passover. This is what the scripture said here in the 23rd. These are the Lord's appointed feasts, the sacred assemblies you are to proclaim 
at their appointed time. The Lord passed over, the Lord's Passover begins at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. On the 15th day of that month, the Lord's Feast of Unleavened Bread begins, because, see, they're held simultaneously. For seven days you must eat bread made without yeast. Yeast stands for sin. Yeast is leaven and sin in most cases. There's one or two exceptions. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly and, and do no work. For seven days, <clears throat> present an offering made to the Lord by fire. And on the seventh day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. <coughs> Excuse me. That's, that's in regard to the Passover. The second one, that's and, and, the, and unleavened bread. Now, the second one that's mentioned there is called the Feast of First Fruits. And it's not to take place immediately like the Passover was. Passover had already taken place. It was the great act of God and his redemption of Israel, his rescue of Israel. That is something that you have to keep in mind. The second one here is he's saying the first fruits will be when you go into the land and you conquer the promised land that you, you'll be coming into. It said, just at the outset, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you enter the land I'm going to give you and you reap its harvest, bring to the priest a sheath of the first grain you harvest. A sheath, for those of you who've never been around the farm, when it used to be when we cut wheat, with a cradle, uh, that's a mowing size with a, with a thing back here to catch it when you cut it. When you cut it and you, and you get a handful about that big around, then you take a, a, a few pieces of wheat, wrap around it, and tie it. That, that, and so you've got a, a, a bunch of wheat tied together like that. And they were to be a wave offering before the Lord. This is You were presenting that to the Lord. The first fruits go to the Lord. Now, it's interesting that they actually had two first fruits. And, uh, and and it's an it's and if you don't know what if you don't do some research that won't make sense. How can you have two first fruits? Doesn't anybody want to be a second fruit? You, you'd have to, I guess, not, because th there are two. But the reason for that is when they got into the land and they sowed th their the grain and so on for the there were two harvests. The first harvest was barley. Barley is generally referred to as the grain for young folks or for, for poor folks. But 50, I get this, around 50 days later, and that 50 is a big deal now, 50 days from Passover to the Mount, to the giving of the law. Now we've got 50 days from the, from the barley harvest to the wheat harvest. And when 50 days later, then they would take something. And, and so why are there two harvests? And remember, you have this dual thing all through the Bible in order to, to help us to understand when Messiah comes because everything points to the coming of the Messiah. When the Messiah comes, that two different things, that two different harvests are going to be a big deal. First fruits also nearly always refer to resurrection. Resurrection. In the New Testament, when the Messiah comes, it refers to the resurrection because uh, the Apostle Paul in the 15th chapter, and we deal with the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians at Easter time. And Passover and Easter on your calendar are almost exactly the same time. And so 50 days later we will come to something else. But, it, but the Apostle Paul wrote in that 15th chapter that Jesus was the first fruit from the grave. First fruits. He was... And so the harvest of God in the church begins. And you'll see that in just a minute. The harvest, first of all, uh, is from the Jews. The early church, the first church, was all Jewish. And it created a problem. The problem was, do you have to become a Jew to become a Christian? And the first council of Christianity was about trying to resolve that problem. And uh, I'm not going to tell you how they resolved it now. Now, so there were two harvests, and the two harvests ended up indicating the first harvest was for the Jews, the second harvest for Gentiles. Dual harvest. All of these details are going to be used in the New Testament to explain what happens when Messiah comes. Who's the Messiah? Jesus, of course. Now then. So there are two harvests, so that way there were two first fruits, and of the believers' 
uh, if you look in the New Testament, it, it will tell you that, uh, that, uh, that, that the second first fruits of the, represents um, the, the Christians. And, and, and I don't have time to deal with that because it's already uh, sneaking up on seven or eight minutes for quitting time. So we, we kind of leave it at that, and we're going to the, um, and we come to the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks is called that because it said, here's what you're to do. Well, let's read it. From the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought the sheath of the wave offering, count off seven full weeks. Okay, seven full weeks is how many days? Say 49, if you can't count. Okay, seven times seven turns out 49 almost every time. Then he says, count 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath and then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. From wherever you live, bring two loaves made of two tenths of, uh, of fine flour, and there's a reason for the fine flour, baked with yeast. Ah, now we got yeast in here. Why would you bake two loaves? What do the two stand for? Jews and Gentiles. Two loaves baked with yeast. What does yeast stand for? Say sin. Oh, you did good. You're getting there. Okay, so we got Jews and Gentiles all sinners, right? And since all are sinners, all need salvation, both Jew and Gentile. Being an Israeli doesn't get you to heaven in spite of what some of the, well, in spite of what some people say. Messiah, the Messiah comes. And now everybody, there's a new covenant. And the law is replaced with grace and mercy. Making it possible to answer the question, what happens when with the living God? Is this thing on? Are you awake? All right, good. All right, just checking, because it looks like you're asleep as can be. Because you better get on to this if you think you're going to go to heaven. Because this is tough stuff, but necessary to know if you're going to appreciate the Bible. All right. So the two loaves represent Jews and Gentiles, all of whom are sinners, because the loaves here that were represented uh, are, are filled with yeast, which represents sin. And the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That mean, all means all. All right. Now then, so here, here's what's going on. And then, there's, then he says, this is kind of interesting. He says, and you make these two loaves with fine flour. Flour, he says, that has been ground down until it is consistent. We will touch on this in just a minute. Keep it in the back of your head. Okay. So now what we have to do in, in order to keep up with what we're saying is to read what you were supposed to read that you didn't read. And therefore, you're going to get at least a C plus, no better. This is the second chapter of the book of Acts referring to the Feast of Pentecost, or 50 days. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. These are the early Christians. And suddenly, get this, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Do you remember what it was like on Mount Horeb when the law was given? There was fire. There was noise. There was smoke. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages or tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, get this, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven because three times a year the men... Uh, were required to come to Jerusalem for one of the three great feasts. That was Tabernacles, Pentecost, and Passover. And when they heard that noise, that sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in their own language. Utterly amazed, they said, are not these men who are speaking Galileans? That's the same as saying, aren't these guys Kentuckians? You guys are dead. You're dead. There's no hope. You're, 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 you're dead and gone. Gosh. Okay. Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, 
Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our, in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, perplexed, they ask one another, what in the world is going on? The same thing that happened on, 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 at the time that Israel was turned loose and 50 days later they came to the foot of the mountain and received the law and became a people. The same thing was happening all anew now. Jesus said you can't put new wine in old wineskins. This is a whole new thing that God is doing. He's creating something new where they're no longer Jews and Gentiles but they all come together and they're one in Jesus Christ. That's the reason I hate denominations. I despise them. I despise splits. We're all one in Christ. Sinners, to be sure, who are trying to, to be molded into the image of Jesus Christ. But there's only one church, and we ought to act like it. But we've kind of failed at that through the years, to say the least. Now, Pentecost is always a dateless day. It is 50, years after, or 50 days after Passover. Why? Because at Passover, God did a great thing. He rescued his people. Now, 50 days later at Pentecost, 50 days later at Pentecost, he's doing now a new thing. He's creating what's called the ecclesia, the, the, where we get our word ecclesiastical. He's creating the church, the church, the body of Christ. He's creating a new thing where we're no longer divided according to color or background or from all over the world, from every nation under the sun. It, there, when we find our life in Messiah, we're one. We're one. we got to remember that and treat each other that way. The love of Jesus expressed to us in that particular way. Now, according to the clock, I'm done, but I ain't. Well, it creates a little problem here. And it's interesting that when that great giving of the law that made Israel a people, 3,000 people died. On the day of Pentecost, with the preaching of the gospel by Peter to that great power of people, 3,000 people were saved and baptized. See, when the new covenant, when Messiah comes, there's the giving of life. Under the law, under sin, there's death. From death to life in the Messiah, who is Jesus the Christ. We've got to keep that in mind. Now, uh, we'll, we'll wind this thing up, I guess, because you're probably hungry and sleepy. Now, here, let's go back to this one thing here. He said, the making of the flour that represents Jew and Gentiles in the two loaves, you should do by grinding the flour until it's perfectly consistent. Look, now we do that with fancy stuff. We have, you know, colanders and so on where you can put stuff through and, and make it all consistent and so on and so forth, grind it down. And what he's really talking about here is, is that even though we are one, there are going to be troubles. Part of life is suffering and trouble. And no one is immune to it. No one. Because the enemy, we still have an enemy, and his primary tool is death. The last enemy that we face, according to Corinthians, is death itself. That's the tool of the devil. The law and the devil bring death. But Jesus gives life. Not only life, but he gives it eternally to all who will put their life and identify with the Messiah. But all of life, all of difficulties come to us, and these difficulties have a good thing, or they can because we're, we're so selfish by nature. You and I are so selfish that if unless we are forced to, we just continue to be centered on self. What kind of house I live in, how much money I make, what kind of car I drive, what kind of vacation I get, da, 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 all about self, 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 self. But Jesus died on the cross to purchase a people who were all about him. And so how do we get from being selfish to being primarily concerned about glorifying God in our life? Let your light so shine among men that all may see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven, Jesus said there in the Sermon on the Mount. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. These difficulties come to life and can be a good thing. The Bible talks about 
uh, uses gold and the refining of gold as an illustration of what we're talking about here. To make gold years ago, uh, I was in the steel business for a long time, and, and for steel to become molten metal, it has to get to about 2,600 degrees. Uh, gold is lower than that. Get around 2,000 degrees, it starts becoming malleable and so on and so forth. And so, but, but the principle is the same. You heat it up and, let, and cook it for a while, and the, immature, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, raw materials that are not gold come to the top. It's called, in Scripture, dross. In steel mills, called slag. It comes to the top. And so what you do is you, have, you develop a way to scrape off the impurities. And then you cook it some more, and do you know what happens? More comes to the surface. You scrape that off, and then you look into it, see how it's going. Cook it some more. Some more dross comes up, or slag, while you want to move it. And you keep doing this until you look into the gold, and you can see your own reflection. And so the Bible uses this as an illustration that God will send us difficulties in life to get rid of the selfish nature that we all have until our life reflects our God. You know. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's where we're to be headed. It ain't easy. It comes with it. Do you like difficulties? Heck no. You can have mine. I don't want them. <laughs> but we're going to have them. And you can either use the difficulties of life to push you toward dependence and living for the Messiah and it, your life will be better than it's ever been before or you can just get bitter about having to go through difficulty. That's the choice. That we all can make. All can make. Better or better? I recommend better. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for these feasts that you point out to us here that all point to Jesus. Help us, oh God, to get to the place where our lives reflect the presence of Jesus so that people can see in us and want to find and, and start searching for what we have in us that causes us to, 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 to experience difficulty and suffering and still praise you for it, Father, because it makes us more like Jesus. Thank you, Father, for loving us and making it possible with all of our selfishness and sin to find access to you through Jesus Christ, our Messiah and our Savior. Dismiss us now, Father, with your richest favor. Help us to remember at least a little bit of what we learned. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're free to go. Christ Community meets on Saturday at 5 p.m. and Sunday at 10.30 a.m. For more information, visit www.christcommunity.net or check out our Facebook page.